Welcome back. And this is going to be my second video about interaction terms, and I'm going to dive into an actual real interaction here uh, by simulating a, a, a new data set. And again, I'm going to have variables x and w, but here I'm looking at the relation between x and y. Uh, what I'm seeing is something that might be a little bit more worrisome, uh, a lot more scatter, and you know, just quickly eyeballing it, uh, a good bit of heteroscedasticity. So you know, this, this sort of data set, which is the sort of thing we do encounter in the real world a good bit, uh, would violate the assumption of constant variance. The variance is clearly very much higher when x is 10 and much lower when x is 1. Um, similarly, if I look at the relationship between y and w, which I've again color-coded, kept it at these three discrete values, I also see a good bit of heteroscedasticity there. Uh, so uh, when w is small at zero, there's much less variability, and when w is high at six, there's much more variability. Now you might start to panic and be like, oh, we didn't cover how to deal with variability, uh, with, with changes in variability. Um, I'm gonna actually point out in this case uh, that we don't actually need to do that. Uh, so, but first, let's see what happens when we fit our standard linear regression. So I'm gonna fit my standard linear model of just uh, y is a function of x. Um, in that case, now that I've colored things by w, we can see that I actually did a pretty good job at capturing the, uh, the intermediate value, the red pluses, uh, but really not capturing the two other relationships, one where there's almost no relationship between for the black between uh, x and y, and one where uh, for the green, the relationship between x and y is a good bit steeper. That said, I'm still doing better than random, so my uh, regression model comes out uh, significant, though only explains about 22% of the variability. I can do a similar thing for w. I can fit a uh, linear model there, add uh, just lm y tilde w. And again, that comes out significant. Uh, actually, even though it's not nearly visually as dramatic as the other one, we actually have a higher r squared just from w alone. Uh, and then we put x and w together. Um, here's what we get. And so again, what I did, I'm using the same trick I used in the last video, uh, where I made predictions at the, these, this low, medium, and high value of w in terms of looking at the relationship between x and y. Again, this is particularly easy here because X, you know, W only took on discrete values, but you could, in theory, do something similar with um, with continuous W just by binning your data into you know high, medium, low, or four categories, five categories, whatever, as a way of kind of exploring the patterns. And what we see again is that uh, the underlying linear model, when we have multiple parameters is uh, multiple covariates is representing that as w is modifying the intercept of the relationship between x and y. And that seems fine at the intermediate level, but seems to be systematically uh, off at the high and low levels of w with these two extreme relationships. So how do we handle that? So again, uh, for that, just noting that even though it didn't do great, it still was significant. Um, combining the two parameters, the two models uh, did well and increased the R squared to almost 80%. So uh, we're moving in the right direction, but we're still clearly missing something. And that would kind of jump out at you when we start doing, looking at our diagnostics. And we look at our diagnostics, we have a clear pattern in the residuals, and that's clearly going to be driven by uh, both the uh, green and the black data where, um, you know, we have uh, departures uh, from the expected trend as things increase. Our normal assumption isn't hor horrible. Our assumption of constant variance, uh, once we include both terms, isn't horrible. That We didn't look at this just for uh, each of them alone, but it would have been clearly violated when we looked at each of them alone. Um, cool. So, the next thing I'm going to do as a way of trying to address this is to add what's called an interaction term. So I'm literally going to write, uh, in addition to my beta zero 
intercept beta one x beta two w. I'm going to add a beta three, or that should have been a subscript on three uh, times x times w. So I'm now creating essentially a new variable. If by an analogy to what we did with the polynomial, we could imagine recoding this as some new variable z that is x times w. Um, and I'm putting that in, and that's what that's what an interaction term is. It literally represents uh, the multiplication of two of our variables together, uh, and essentially treating it as an as if it were a new column. Um, similar to how with a polynomial, we you know raise one of our variables to a power and treat it as a new column. Uh, so let's see what that does, and then we'll talk about why that does what it does. So here I'm now fitting a linear model. In that linear model, I have my x plus my w plus x times w. So I'm literally just multiplying uh, the two together. Now, when I color, when I make predictions uh, for each of these values of, so when I make predictions for the relationship between x and y, where I'm varying uh, each of these, oh, sorry, I'm color coding the data by the value of w and then making a plot that accounts for that as well. Uh, so when I'm including this interaction term, uh, now I'm seeing that the, the, this model is actually capturing uh, what I was seeing visually, which is that the, the slope was clearly not the same for uh, the relationship between x and y, but the slope in the relationship between x and y actually varied uh, with w which is different from our simple uh, multiple regression model where, again, if I don't have the interaction terms, what I'm, what I'm assuming is that the uh, covariates are modifying the intercept. So here we can see uh, our interaction term is significant. Our R squared is now up to you know, 97%. And when we look at our residuals, uh, there's no trend in our residuals. Our, QQ looks fine, our scale location looks fine. So everything looks fine in this case because in fact this model is doing well and in fact that's because we simulated this data uh, in, in a way that conforms uh, to that um, assumption just for the purposes of demonstration. So, <clears throat> so why does this work and how do we interpret uh, this interaction term? So the key point here is that we can take our model here uh, intercept plus beta 1x, beta 2w, plus beta 3x times w, and refactor this like we did before, but before we refactored that how beta 0 plus beta 2w, you know, put that in parentheses as the new intercept. Here I'm going to take beta 1 and beta 3 and factor out the x. So I'm going to take those two terms, put them together, and then realize that there's an x in both of them and factor that out. So I can rewrite this as y equals b0 plus b1x. There's a linear model between b0, uh, between x and y. Uh, but now, not only is the intercept a linear model of w, but also the slope is a linear model uh, as well. So that's just pointing out that uh, what you can rewrite an interaction term in terms of how one covariate affects uh, the, the, the slope rather than just how one covariate affects, the other covariate affects the intercept. Uh, it's also worth noting that you can actually write down models with higher order interactions terms as well. So if I had uh, covariates, you know, x, w, and z, uh, I could write down, you know, the interaction between x and w, the interaction between x and uh, z, so how x and, so, so then, then you would have uh, x as a, the, the slope would be a linear model of both x, so the, the slope of the intercept, the, the relationship between x and y would be a function of both w and z, but then you could also write down a three-way interaction between x, y, and, sorry, x, w, and z, which is where, you know, not only is there a, a, a linear model on, a, on how 
w and z affect the slope of x, but in some sense, now you have uh, the effect of z on the slope of the relationship of how x modifies the slope of, of how w modifies the slope of x. Uh, that is a mouthful, and and that is actually important to remember. Interaction term, multiple interaction terms are a mouthful, and um, they must be interpreted very carefully. And uh, it is very easy to create models that have huge numbers of interaction terms that are utterly uninterpretable. Uh, so, uh, you know, while you can easily add them to models, I would say uh, you add interaction terms. You know, a first and foremost, when you actually have a hypothesis about the interactions. So you might legitimately have an, a, a hypothesis that states that you think you know, one variable is changing the slope of the relationship uh, between the other two variables. Uh, but you know, it's pretty rare to encounter someone who has a hypothesis about how a third variable changes the slope of how the second variable changes the slope of the first variable. Uh, so, you know, you, it exists, but, you know, how often do you actually have a clear hypothesis statement about that? I'm not saying it's impossible, you know, we've actually, I've generated these in my lab, uh, but it's pretty rare. Um, and the other, you know, reality is it's very easy to overfit if you put these too many interaction terms. Uh, so, yeah, use them sparingly. Uh, oh, and then, you know, the other place to, to consider them is if you've done these sorts of diagnostics. Uh, to show that that you know when you look at the data, there's a clear indication that th there's a reason to test that interaction. That you've you've looked, you've done sort of the, these visualization, bin visualizations like we talked about here, and have some reason to believe that in fact one variable is in fact modifying the relationship of another. Cool. So that's going to wrap up uh, my discussion of of interaction terms, and in some ways basically wraps up uh, my discussion of of basic linear models. Thanks.